morning, United. Let's go ahead and wrap up our conversations, make our way to a seat. If you don't have a Bible yet, feel free to grab a Bible um, on the side on your way back to your seats. Uh, it's an exciting morning uh, that we have. We're hearing about Franklin, Young Life getting started, Connor's baptism. Congratulations, Connor. I'm really excited for you and what God's doing in your life. And, um, you know, we love to see God work in our community, in our church, and we love our community too. One of the ways that we love our community is by serving our community. Sometimes that means we go out into our community and serve and do different projects. Sometimes it means having people on this property uh, that serves the community. One of the things that we're doing next month is a blood drive, and uh, we're doing that in a couple of weeks. If you're interested in participating in that some way, maybe primarily by giving and donating blood, uh, just put a note on your Connect card, blood drive. We'll make sure we get information to you so that you can sign up for the blood drive coming up. As we start our teaching time, maybe you didn't get a chance to grab your Bible. If I could have a couple ushers pop up and grab some Bibles, that would be really helpful. And uh, we want everybody to have a copy of the Bible when we have our teaching time. And uh, one of the reasons is we just want you to read God's words for yourself and not just believe that it's coming from me. And so if you don't have a copy of a Bible, we'd love to get that into your hands right now. So just raise your hand and wave down one of our ushers who has a Bible if you need one, and they will gladly get one into your hands. So if you need a Bible, just raise your hand. They'll get it to you. If you don't own a Bible or have a copy, just hold on to that um, and keep it for yourself. It's our gift um, for you. Uh, years ago, uh, there was a young man that asked me for financial help. Have, and raise your hand if you've ever been asked for financial help before. Uh, so a couple people. So, all right, look at those guys. That means they probably have some money and ask them for money after church. But um, this guy must not have known I didn't have a lot of money, but either way, he, he asked me for some financial help, and I was open to it, and, and I said, you know what, you're asking me for a considerable amount of money, could you tell me, like, what you're asking for money for? Like, are you dealing drugs, or are you, you know, wanting to do uh, something else uh, with that money? So he explained what he was wanting money for, and uh, one thing became, or two things became clear as he was talking. One, this was not a necessary expense, um, at least in my opinion. Two, uh, I was not the first person he asked for money, um, and he had received several no's already. And, uh, and so I said, uh, you know what, I, I don't think I can help you in that way. And he, and he was very frustrated, um, and he said, Tim, I just want you to treat me like you would treat your sons. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to think about it, I'm going to pray about that, and I'll get back to you. And I did. I spent time praying to God, and I was like, how would I treat my sons in light of the way he's asked me for financial help, what he's asked me for financial help about? Um, and his assumption was that I would give my sons money for this, this need uh, that he saw. And his assumption was wrong. And I said, let's have a conversation. Let's sit down and talk about this. And we sat down, and I opened up the Bible we talked about some biblical principles, and I said, you know what? I'm going to be shoot straight with you. I wouldn't give my sons money for what you're asking for. I would tell them to go get a job, save money, and buy this themselves if they wanted that. Um, and he didn't believe me. And I just continued to kind of persist and say, I'm, I'm being honest with you. And, uh, and he was a little disappointed uh, in the conversation. Uh, and it, I don't think it was a pivotal or helpful conversation necessarily for him. But it was for me, because I realized that young men just need somebody to give them truth sometimes. Uh, the way I would speak to my sons is probably a little bit more frank than I would speak to other young men. You know that within a family, you can speak to a certain family a little bit more straightforward. And, you know, and since that, it was a pivotal conversation for me, because when young men now ask me for advice, I have in my mind, I'm going to give them advice, the same advice I would give to my sons. Um, I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat something. I'm not going to give them, you know, news that they want to hear. I will shoot straight with them. And it's really changed my uh, kind of outlook on how to give advice. And now I'm not going around giving unsolicited advice to people. Um, but uh, when guys ask, I'll shoot straight with them. And I thought about that story as we get to this next passage in Thessalonians, because Paul, this is exactly what he does. He gets to two really tough topics, and he's just like, telling people like it is. He's shooting straight about God's word and God's thoughts on two topics um, that are hard for us to hear truth about, which is sex and work. 
And Paul is shooting straight with these young believers. If you haven't been with us uh, the last few weeks, Paul is an apostle who started this church in a town called Thessalonica. And there's these young new believers that just started following Jesus. They're just starting to understand the Christian faith. And, and in this letter, Thessalonians, um, if you don't have uh, your Bible open to it yet, you can open up to 1 Thessalonians. And if you borrowed a Bible from us, it's on page 574. And this is the passage that we're going to be reading this morning. Um, and it's going to be introduced to, like, Paul just, like, giving very straightforward um, thoughts on these two topics of sex and work. And so in light of these topics, um, the message is PG-13. Um, and so if you have younger ears listening to this message, use your own discretion about staying in the room um, or, uh, or just covering ears at certain parts. Uh, but uh, we're just going to talk about sex and work, but it's PG-13, not R or X or anything like that. Uh, so let's read the Bible and see what Paul says about some of these topics. Um, he kind of takes a little bit of time to get there, um, but look at verse 1. It says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you received from us, how you ought to walk and please God, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. So Paul has already instructed the Thessalonian believers on some of these topics. They're actually doing that, but he wants them to do that more and more. And verse 2 says, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. And so one of the things that he is talking about is like you're doing this more and more. You uh, you're, you, you've done this. You've changed your life. You know, as you've come to Christ, Christ has started to change your life, and you're following him more and more. Um, but he's saying, you haven't arrived yet, and neither have I. And that's part of becoming a Christian, is you never arrived. As much as we are celebrating Con or coming to life in Jesus, he's not perfect now because he placed his faith in Jesus. I'm not perfect because I stand on the stage and talk about Jesus. Um, one of the things about the Christian life that we see very clearly in these first two verses is growth in our relationship with Jesus is never complete on this side of eternity. We're always growing. We're always learning more about God. We're always becoming more like Jesus. We don't ever claim to be perfect people. We don't ever claim to have our act together. In fact, we need more help. And Paul is communicating to these new believers, your life is totally changed because the Thessalonian believers, their life really changed but he's helping them understand you ha still have more growing to do. And, and so he's not writing anything new to them necessarily here, um, but he's helping them and reminding them of some instructions. And one of the things that he starts talking about is the purpose of life. And one of the things that he writes about here is one of the purposes of life is to please God. In fact, the main purpose of life, Paul advocates, is to please God to worship, and to live for him. That's the main purpose that God created us for, to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of our lives, to say to God, like, you're God, I'm not. So you're in control. I'll take my cues from you. Um, if you created me, I'm the creature. Tell me how to live, and I'll live that way. And Paul goes on to write how to please God in these verses. And so how do we please God is like the main question that Paul's getting at with some of the specific instructions that he's given in this passage of the Bible. Um, and if you don't believe that your life exists to please God, you're really going to struggle with what we read. Um, uh, if, if you don't believe <clears throat> that your life exists to please God, you're going to struggle with God in this life. You're going to struggle with his instructions in the Bible. Um, you're going to struggle to follow him and submit to him and to do the things that he calls you to do in the Bible. Many of you do live this way. Many of you want to submit your life to God to please him, and you've submitted your life to God. And here is how he says we can please God. Look it back at the Bible. Um, it says, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Verse 3 then goes, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. So he's not only just saying, like, this is how you please God, but he's also saying this is the will of God. Did you ever wonder, like, what does God want me to do in life? What is God's direction? Like, often we'll ask those questions about maybe a job or a relationship. Like, does God want me to go in this direction or do this? Is it his will for me to do this? Well, here it says really specifically in the Bible, this is why we want you to hold a Bible and read it for yourselves, is Paul is saying this is the will of God for you. Well, what does it say is the will of God? Your sanctification. Now, 
some of us maybe have never heard this word before. What does that mean? Your sanctification. That's kind of a funny word. What this word in the Bible means, it means to be set apart. It means when you follow Jesus, your life completely changes. Jerry said you were an old person becoming a new creation. And when you follow Jesus, you become a new person. You submit your life to God, and your sanctification is to be set apart, um, to be like God, to become like Jesus Christ. So you're going to start to change in different ways. That addiction that you struggled with, you're going to start to have a sense of like, I don't need that anymore. I don't need to go there for that fulfillment. Now I have Jesus. And so that's a way that our life changes in Jesus. Or maybe you used to need love from a man in order to feel that you were truly valued. And now when you become a Christian, you're like, you know what? I just need love from God. If God loves me, that's enough for me. doesn't mean you don't ever continue to struggle, but then maybe you move on from abusive relationships and you have a higher standard for a man in your life. Now, maybe you are consumed with making more and more money, and all you can think about is, am I making m enough money or more money to buy more things? And when you trust in Jesus, you start thinking, how can I give money away? Those are ways that I know a lot of people in this room have been sanctified, to use this word that we're looking at in the Bible, to be set apart, to be changed into the image of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, hey, this is a lifelong journey. We're going to be on it for a long time, get used to it. But he goes to his very first topic that he's uh, getting at, and that's sex. And so this is one of the ways that you are sanctified. This is God's will for you if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, we're not telling you to live this way. But if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, this is God's will, your sanctification, keep reading, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. I don't know about you. Is that direct? Seems pretty straightforward. You see, the, thing, the situation that we're reading, these words were written 2,000 years ago. They weren't written to people in Reisterstown, Maryland, or to America. They were written to people who lived 2,000 years ago in a town called Thessalonica. And I don't know about you, but we need to learn a little bit about Thessalonica to understand these words. Uh, if I say Sin City, what city comes to mind? Vegas. Vegas. Las Vegas, right? All right. And if I start to say the motto, whatever happens in Vegas, Vegas. stays in Vegas. All right. Thessalonica was kind of like Vegas. Like, I went to Las Vegas. The first time I remember going to Las Vegas, I just remember walking down the sidewalk and seeing advertisements to just turn right into a strip club. And it was really easy just to go and into a strip club or, you know, to pursue sex for sale in a variety of ways. Now, Thessalonica, um, you know, there wasn't a slogan, but if there was a slogan, it wouldn't be whatever happens in Thessalonica stays in Thessalonica. It would be whatever happens in Thessalonica is awesome and tell everybody about it. And here is a quote from a, a scholar that can help us understand the, the culture of Thessalonica. It says, a man might have a mistress who could provide him also with intellectual companionship. The institution of slavery made it easy for him then to have a concubine. So that's a second relationship with a woman. While casual gratification was readily available from a harlot or a prostitute. Third classification. Then the function of his wife, meaning this dude has a wife, as well as three other relationships with women. He was to manage his, or this woman was to manage his household and to be the mother of his legitimate children and heirs. See, in American culture, you hide these relationships from your wife, right? If you're doing them. Hopefully nobody is doing those relationships. In, in Thessalonica culture, it's like, no, everybody knows about my relationships with my concubine and with my mistress and with my harlot and then with my wife. Any wives here open to this kind of arrangement, by the way? You know, open? No, you're not. You're laughing because it's so ridiculous. Um, and, but yet, uh, we think our culture is totally off the rails. And our culture is unique, and it's totally not. You know, you might not like what's being taught in health class in school, but imagine raising your daughter to look forward to her life as a secret mistress. 
Imagine your daughter, you know, she might be an enslaved concubine or a street prostitute, or maybe she will be a wife. But unfortunately, she's not going to be a cherished spouse. She'll just be a used woman. You know, today, there's much more value ascribed, rightly so, to women. Um, Today, rightly so, human trafficking is condemned, and many of these things are condemned. But one thing does remain true, even though our culture is different, is sexual purity is still not a virtue that is valued. Sexual purity wasn't a virtue that was valued in Thessalonica, and it's not valued today. Nobody is saying, that's a great job, that you're a high school or middle school student, and you haven't had sex yet. They're making fun of you if you haven't had sex yet. You know, in the 80s, if you watch the movie 16 Candles, Molly Ringwald uh, introduced the world to 16 being this age of being sexually active and being good and okay. Today, the age is much lower. And yet the Bible is a book that applies from generation to generation, decade, century, millennia after millennia, to all people. When Paul wrote these words, the Thessalonians, It applied to other cities. It applies to all peoples of all nations, of all ages, of all genders. God's will for you, he says it really straightforward, is to be sanctified and to abstain from sexual immorality. It's clear, it's direct, and it's authoritative. He says this is through Jesus. Like these are Jesus. I, I learned this as a follower of Jesus. This is God's will for you. And if you embrace this as a follower of Jesus, you're going to be swimming upstream in culture the rest of your life. Now, the question is, well, what does he mean by sexual immorality? You know, so abstain, but what exactly am I staying away from? Well, Paul makes a contrast. Look at verse 5, where he says, don't be like the Gentiles um, who do not know God. Uh, Why does he say don't be like the Gentiles? Because any craving that they had, they would just go out and fulfill it and satisfy it. They had no restraint. But Paul is saying, when you start to follow Jesus, you start to have restraint. It's not just in areas of sex. It's restraint from that drink. It's it's restraint from, you know, taking that drug. It's restraint from those different vices that we all face in life. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives and give us the ability to us, for us to restrain ourselves from doing that. And so that's what Paul is saying is, don't be like the Gentiles who have no restraint. You're a different person now in Jesus Christ. You have the ability to say no. And the word that he actually uses here is is a word that you might, it might sound um, similar. The Greek is pornea. Um, And we immediately probably connect this word to pornography, which is certainly in view of things to abstain from. But this word had a really broad meaning. And so I'll give my definition for pornea. It's any sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage. Meaning, I'm looking to all of Scripture to help us understand what this Greek word means. And for Paul to use this word, it's kind of like a really comprehensive catch-all. If I told you, um, as a parent, I, was, I have five children, and if one of them got in trouble and I said, hey, there's no screen time for a week. Um, so when I say no screen time, If my kid were to say, well, what about video games? What do you think the answer is? No. Okay. Well, how about TikTok? That's media, right? Well, well, how about Netflix? No. Media. It's all off limits, right? It's a comprehensive term. This same word, pornea, is a comprehensive term when it comes to, well, what about this? You know, well, I'm not going all the way. Well, Paul's saying, abstain from that. Well, I'm not engaging in it. I'm just looking at it. No, abstain from that. Well, we're going to be married anyway. No, abstain from that. He's kind of like it's a catch-all phrase to say, we're different people when we follow Jesus. And it's going to be weird, and it's going to look different. We're not telling people who don't follow Jesus to do these things. But if you are a Christian and decide to follow him, this is the standard that you're given. Now, If you're not a Christian and you're here this morning, you're hearing this, you're probably thinking, I'm crazy, people who believe this are crazy, and that there's a negative view of sex that we have. And that may or may not be a valid criticism of Christians. But the Christian view of sex is actually that it's a good gift from God. Like the two words that we're talking about this morning, sex and work, he actually gives a lot more verses uh, Paul does about sex. Um, Is there good gifts? There are good things. 
Sex is a good gift to be enjoyed between a husband and a wife in the context of a marriage. It has multiple purposes of enjoyment, emotional attachment, procreation. There are good things about sex. That's why Paul says in this, um, these verses, you know, let sex be honorable. Let it be holy. It can be those things. Yet the Thessalonians, as we've seen, like they're living in a culture where sex has become really twisted and distorted. We know sex has become twisted and distorted through human trafficking and through abuse. Maybe sex was a tool of evil in your life where you have experienced abuse and hurt. People have chosen sex over their family and the addiction that it has, and they've ruined their family because of it. There are people that pursue sex as an idol instead of following God. No, I'd rather have this And they've rejected God just simply because of sex. See, Satan's subtle strategy to keep a lot of people from following God and to keep people who even follow God discouraged in a relationship with him is to encourage sexual activity outside of marriage and to discourage it in a marriage. If you're a married couple, you're like, yep, I know what you're talking about. There's, Jesus didn't say don't commit adultery just for the sake of saying don't commit adultery. He knew that for many married couples, the pull to somebody else would be really strong in certain times of marriage. It's like, you know what? The grass is greener with this person instead of my spouse. And that's why Jesus says, don't commit adultery, because he knew that the pull to it would be strong. Um, He knew that uh, not just committing adultery, um, but to, for a spouse to have Uh, you know, not want to even have sex with their spouse would be a temptation to deprive one another of that. There's an instruction in the Bible. It says, don't deprive your spouse from sex. Um, It's it's a good gift to be enjoyed. Don't keep it from your spouse. So there's instructions in the Bible about sex. So this is not just an instruction to unmarried people. It's for married people as well as unmarried people, um, for divorced people, for single people, whatever label you want to give yourself. But this instruction hits those who are unmarried as well. When you think of the teaching of what the Bible says about sexual activity outside of marriage, it's a really high call to pursue Jesus and to honor him with your body sexually. It's a huge challenge. This is why Paul then says to young couples that are pursuing Jesus that are struggling to wait to have sex, if you're burning with passion, then just get married. He's like telling young couples that are burning with passion, Quick, just get married. Don't let this trip you up. And the concept is really clear throughout Scripture. It's really clear. Paul shoots straight that sexual purity is how followers of Jesus are called to live. And this is why God gives us his Holy Spirit. He gives us his Holy Spirit to live in us, to guide us, to help us, to give us restraint, not like the Gentiles, but to give us restraint because of who he is and how he wants us to live. And so there's three words that I want to give you this morning that can help all of us, no matter what label we have, married or unmarried, um, to help us pursue sexual purity. And the first is resist. And I want to ask you, what is your temptation or what's your threshold to resist temptation in this area of sexuality? You know, some of you may have the resolve to simply say, no, um, I'm not going to do that. You know, there's a reason why Paul says, don't be like the Gentiles who just act upon impulses because all of us feel that way. All of us have impulses. You know, we're human beings. And what the scriptures tell us is there are three different ways, and one is resisting temptation. That is there a threshold that you're like, you know what? I can resist that. I can resist sexual temptation in these situations. But do you know your threshold? Because there's probably some situations where you're like, you know what? When I get into that situation, I can't. And that's why the next word would be flee. And so we see this in a great example of Joseph in the Old Testament when Potiphar's wife comes on to him and he literally runs away, leaving his clothes behind because she's like stripping off his clothes from him. If you don't believe that's a true story in the Bible, you can go and read it for yourself in the book of Genesis. And he's fleeing from a situation um, where he doesn't want to fall and falter um, and dishonor God. So maybe fleeing a situation is simply turning off the TV or the computer, getting out of the car or bedroom to physically remove yourself from a situation or you're not sure that you'll be able to pursue God's standard of sexual purity. But if you can't flee a situation, maybe the third word that you need to consider is what do you need to completely avoid? 
See, when you know your threshold and the certain situations that you put yourself in, maybe you just know that you're never going to succeed in that situation or environment. And maybe you need to completely avoid it. Maybe that coworker, you just can't go out to lunch alone with them or drive in the car with them because you know that you will do something that's inappropriate. You will pursue them when you shouldn't. You know, maybe you think, I could be in groups of people with this person. I could be alone with them, grab lunch together with them, you know, hang out together. But when it's in the basement and it's dark and we're watching a movie, you know what? Probably shouldn't be in that situation. I had a friend in New Jersey when we lived up in New Jersey for 10 years. Uh, one of the, his commitments, one of the things that he uh, decided to do was he refused to go to the beach. He just avoided the beach at all costs. And I know this is crazy, and it was a really extreme example. But this was how he wanted to make sure he pursued sexual purity. He didn't want to look too much at other women at the beach. And so he didn't go to the beach. I know that's really extreme. You know, and some of you are like, why would we listen to this advice? Why would we even consider living this way? Well, first in verse 7, go back to the Bible. Because again, again, I want to answer these questions with the Bible. Verse 7 says, God did not call us to impurity, but to holiness. Why, my friend, he wanted to be holy. And the best thing he could do was not go to the beach to be holy. He doesn't say, he didn't tell me that I had to do that. He didn't tell anybody else around him that they had to do that. We're not making up rules here, and we never will make up rules here for what you need to do or what you don't need to do. We will look to the Bible, and it says really clearly, avoid sexual immorality, abstain from it. And all of us will have different thresholds that we can resist or we can't. All of us will be able to, um, so, you know, have to have different opinions and thoughts on whether we need to flee a certain situation or avoid a certain situation. But the call is to be holy. There's a man, I think I've shared the story before about Augustine, who was um, a a famous uh, historical leader in the church. And he had a life of licentiousness and just pursuing whatever sexual appetite he could pursue before he started to follow Jesus. And when he started to follow Jesus, one of the women that was in his life came up to him. And as the story is told, she said, Augustine, Augustine, hey, it's me. And Augustine, just did, he didn't respond to her. And she went, Augustine, Augustine, it's me. And it's one of these women that he had been with. So he, had, he obviously knew her. Um, and he responds and he says, it might be you, but it's no longer me. He had changed, saying like, I'm not the same guy that you once knew. I'm totally different. I'm pursuing Jesus, and I want to be holy and follow him. And I'm a different person now. The second reason, so first to be called to holiness, the second reason that Paul gives, you know, why would we abstain from sexual immorality? Not that God even needs to give us an expl explanation when he gives us a command, but he does here. Because um, disregarding this teaching is rejecting God. Look at verse 8. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man. So this isn't just a preacher at a church saying this. Um, this is not just an opinion that's being given. It's not just some book that we're reading from. These are God's instructions. And God gives you his Holy Spirit to keep this. So we'll, if we were to reject this, particularly if you are here and you're a follower of Jesus, so, yeah, I'm a Christian. I follow Jesus. Um, if you're to reject this, you're essentially rejecting God. Um, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're probably just thinking we're really crazy right now. I mean, this is like the one Sunday. We don't talk about sex every Sunday. Um, we don't talk about a bunch of rules that you need to follow. This is just where we're at in this book of the Bible. And it's really straightforward. And yet, it's straightforward because God wants to keep us holy and pure and to follow him. My guess is that some of us who do follow Jesus might be experiencing shame from hidden sin in our life, current struggles that we have, maybe past regrets that come to mind that still haunt us about different sexual activity. And you know what? This is where we need to be reminded, whether we follow Jesus or don't, that God is a good God. He's a loving God. He's a forgiving God. He is a God who is rich in mercy full of kindness, ready to extend forgiveness to anybody who would come and ask for it, who would confess their sin. If you feel defeated, you don't need to let past failures or current struggles beat you down this morning. You can be free from these vices that keep you from following Jesus in purity. And when you come to Jesus, he gives his Holy Spirit 
to you. It gives you the power to say no, to restrain yourself. Are you asking for help from the Holy Spirit? God, the Holy Spirit, help me to honor you. If you aren't, you should start trying to do that. If this is your first time in church or you haven't been in a while, you're likely saying, this is not for me. I'm not really interested in this. And I would totally understand why I did that. I would have done that. Listen, this is a teaching of the Christian faith, but this is not the Christian faith. This isn't where the Christianity begins and ends. Christianity begins and ends with Jesus and a relationship with him and a relationship with other people who follow Jesus. That's why if you look back to the verses that we're reading this morning, Paul kind of does a little reprieve here in verse 9. Look at it. He says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. They have experienced love from God, and so they're to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 10 says, For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. What the Christian faith is about is about love. It's about the love of God for us. And as we experience God's love for us, we love other people that way. We, especially those who are other followers of Jesus Christ. If you missed the beginning of this book of the Bible that we're studying, 1 Thessalonians, the first three chapters, chapters 1, 2, and 3, are all about God's love, not just for us, but that we experience with one another. Paul loves these people. He's thanking God regularly for these people in chapter 1. In chapter 2, Paul is saying, I've loved you like a mother who loves an infant. I love you like a father who's gently instructing a child. In chapter 3, Paul says, I want to see you again. I want to visit with you. Like there's this sense of like camaraderie and deep love that Paul has for these fellow Christians. And so if you're wondering like, hey, is Christianity, all of these just rules. It's, no, it's not. It's all about a life of love and about a life of community and real relationships that seek to honor one another rather than defraud one another. And so then the chapter in the middle of two very strong instructions that, that we're hearing this morning and that we're going to see the second one in a second is Paul just put a little reminder in here. Keep loving each other well. Continue to do this more and more. They're, these guys, it says they're, they're kind of like famous for their love for each other. It's, it's spreading through Macedonia is what it says. And he's telling them just to continue to be loving to each other. So let's keep going. And what's the second instruction? So that's the first one is about sex. The second one is real brief. There's like eight verses devoted to that. There's only one verse devoted to the next one. It's clear and brief though. But we urge you, look at verse 10, brothers to do this more and more. Again, he's saying continue to love more and more. And then this topic, verse 11, to aspire to live quietly to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So here his simple instruction is aspire to a quiet life. And to be honest, I think this is as much a challenge as sexuality is a challenge in our culture to be and live a quiet life. Raise your hand if you would love to, to have a quiet life. And I would call you out if you did raise your hand and say, not really, because you just told all of us that you want a quiet life. And so somebody that really wants a quiet life is like, no, don't look at me. I don't want to be noticed. You know, like, leave me alone. And, uh, and so, but yet our culture, you know, it's not very quiet. It's like, how many followers can I get? How many likes can this post get? Or how many people is attention? What can I get through saying this thing or doing that thing? You know, our culture is addicted to entertainment and excitement. Suggest to a teenager on a Friday night, why don't you just hang home and read a book? You know, like, no way. Like, there's laughter because that's so boring. We need to be excited. It's more of like, I have an open night. I've been, and there's a party and something happened every night, and there's an open night. There's no thought of, let me stay home and relax. It's like, what other thing is out there that I can do? You know, whether a fun, you know, the kind of question of evaluating our week is, did I have fun this week? You know, and, and there's an adult ver version of that question as well. You know, we might not be chasing fun the same way as a teenager might be. But God speaks into this Thessalonian church, and he says, aspire to live a quiet life. And he says the same thing to us today. God does through his word. Maybe you, you can ask the question, when's the last time things were just calm, quiet? peaceful in my life for some of us it's like i don't know life doesn't feel calm or peaceful and yet paul says aspire to live a quiet life maybe you're saying oh i've got calm and peace all the time 
But here my question would be, are you okay with that? Or in that moment, are you like, oh, I've got to do something. Like, I'm so bored of the calm and quiet. You know, there's something in us often that just longs for more. And yet the Bible is often saying your sanctification is to be set apart. It's to be different. And it's to be different in this way, to aspire to live quietly. So instead of asking, this past week, was it fun? Maybe you should ask, did I do what was good? Did I use my time in a way that honored God? So what exactly does he mean by aspire to live a quiet life? How does he unpack that? He does two things. He says, first, uh, mind your own business. Do you ever say mind your business to somebody? It's not really gracious. I was in this passage, obviously, preparing for Sunday, and there was one day where a couple of my kids were asking me different questions. I said, mind your business. And my wife was like, Tim, be more gracious. And I was like, I'm just saying what the Bible says, right? So it says, mind your business. So it's not really a gracious phrase, but it's a gracious, like, um, you know, it, it is a biblical principle to, like, stop meddling in the lives of others. Like, why do you need to know their business? That's kind of like Paul says to people, like, you don't need to know about everybody's business. You should probably focus more on your own. It's not a badge of honor to have all the dirt on people's lives, to know what they're doing and what they're not doing. Now, there are some exceptions. Kids, don't ever tell your parents this. Um, like, hey, this is not for you to know, mom or dad. I don't think so. Who's paying your bills right now? Um, but generally, you know, this is something we could say, you know what, it's probably not best for you to know that. Mind your own business. And for you, you don't need to go searching for people's business and personal life and issues. Aspire to live quietly. Our lives would really quiet down if we stopped being involved in the business of so many different people that we don't need to be involved in their business. Second thing he says is get to work. Now, there was a specific reason. It's really weird the Thessalonians weren't working. Uh, there's this teaching. If you continue to read this book of the Bible, uh, it talks about Jesus is going to return. So Jesus came. He lived. He died. He was raised from the dead. After 40 days, he ascended into heaven. But there's this teaching going around that we believe, because it's in the Bible, that Jesus is going to return. He's going to come back one day. And so these Thessalonian believers are like, Jesus is going to come back. I'm not going to work. If Jesus is coming back, why should I work? That's a waste of time. That's why one of the main reasons these guys are not working. And so they're just thinking, like, we're just going to wait for Jesus to come back. Work is optional. It's not important. Forget about it. And Paul is saying, that's dumb. Get to work. He's just shooting straight. Remember, I need to shoot straight with that young man. I'm going to shoot straight with my kids. I'll tell them when things are just stupid and get to the point rather than beating around the bush. Now, there's a lot of non-biblical perspectives about work that are out there. I'm just going to focus on what's biblical. Look at your Bible, and you can see what's biblical. It says, work with your hands, meaning there's some work that's hard. you got to do hard work in life. And then it also says there later, work so that you don't depend on help from others. This doesn't mean there's times in our life where we need help from other people. We're going to need help from other people in life. But, but don't go through life always just looking for a handout always just depending on somebody else to pay that bill or do that thing for you. But what you see in the Bible right here is work is not bad. In fact, if you go back to the very beginning of the story of God, where God created a man and a woman, he put them in a garden, they had sex together, and they worked. The two things that we're talking about today. And in this perfect situation, they're called creation gifts that God gave to us, sex and work. In this perfect situation, I think Adam actually worked more than 40 hours a week. So if you feel like all abused by your boss because like, oh, they're asking me to work more than 40 hours, Adam had a six-day work week. He only had one day off. God, when he created the world, he took one day off and gave one day off. And he said, this is good. And so if you're going around complaining about working a lot, get over it. Because God says, this is the work week, it's six days a week. And we live in a world that promotes all these ideas of work less, play more, be your own boss. You know, there's so many different phrases that are out there. You know, find passive income and just live the life you want to live for yourself. That's great if you have passive income, but still work. That is what the Bible says. But yet we can fall into Satan's trap and expect things to come easily for us and avoid hard work and make excuses to be lazy. See, Paul was writing to the Thessalonians 
who manual labor in this Greek culture was despised. It was looked down. Manual labor, that's for slaves. That's not for me. And, you know, the better, you were a better man if you worked less, was the view of that culture. And Paul is like speaking and saying, no, that's not even how God created the world. Before sin entered the world, a man was working. And look at what God did, even in a broken world. He called a carpenter king. Jesus worked. He was a carpenter. He called fishermen apostles. The leaders of the church fished. They worked with their hands. And then tent-making missionaries. If you look back and you have the Bible open, I always encourage you to have the Bible open because in verse chapter, or chapter 2, verse 9, Paul is saying, we worked day and night. We didn't want to be dependent upon you. We worked ourselves. We didn't tell you to put us up in a high-end hotel in the community and pay us lots of money to come here and be with you. Aspire to live a quiet life. Mind your business. Get to work. This is not new things that Paul's writing about. As I've already said, this is back in Genesis chapter 2. You can read for yourself where the world existed without sin and where a husband and wife enjoyed sex together and they worked together. That is the life that God is saying, pursue that. Pursue this. Pursue sex. Pursue work with these boundaries, with this design, because this is design that is holy and brings honor to the name of Jesus Christ. Now, all of us know, like, we just don't see this a lot. We see a lot of brokenness. You see, in our lives, I have screwed up a lot. I have not lived up to this. Nobody in this room has lived up to this. And this is why when we think about the question we started with, how do I please God? You don't please God by just obeying what we read. You please God first and foremost by acknowledging, I can't do it on my own strength. There's nothing I can do. The best things that I can do fall short of a holy God. If I can please God, the most pleasing thing I can do is acknowledge I'm a sinner. I've sinned against him, and I need Jesus to come into my life. Because you see, when Jesus comes into our life, he lived a perfect life for one reason, because none of us can. And he died on the cross to take the consequences of our sin and then to give to us as a gift forgiveness that he earned for us. That might be weird and hard to understand, without a doubt. But that is the gospel message, the good news of the Christian faith. You can please God today, no matter who you are, no matter where you're at in your life, no matter what you've done, by placing your faith in Jesus and saying, I'm going to submit my life to him. That is the most pleasing thing any of us can do for God this morning. And if this is the first time you're hearing any teaching from the Bible or you're newer to the Bible and you've been coming for some time and you're hearing these words, you're like, man, this is really weird. This is all the negative, bad stereotypes I've ever had about the Christian faith right here in this message, especially about the topic of sex. I want to point you to the thing that's most pleasing to God right now, and that's Jesus and placing your faith in him. I want to invite you to do that. I want to invite you to say, I'm going to stop living life for myself, and I want to live for God, and I'm going to trust that he's a good God, and I'm going to trust that the, the words that he gives and he speaks through this Bible, they're good for me. And so let's pray together.